Thanks everyone for joining us. We have a really interesting panel here. We um, have a, a diverse group of perspectives that I, I think you'll find really informative and a broad set of topics to discuss. I thought to uh, lay some groundwork, we could uh, ask each uh, panelist to uh, answer an initial question and provide some context on their organization and their role within that organization. So maybe Nick, maybe if you could uh, kick us off with just characterizing the market environment as you see it and sort of what challenges does that pose to the goals of your organization? Sure. Um, I guess Taleb was the big draw, right? Because we kind of emptied out a little bit here, but it's okay. <laughs> I understand. Um, so I, I guess I would define the environment as being uniquely challenging. Uh, we've got low economic growth, low rates of unemployment, uh, low inflation, unprecedented central bank intervention, low rates, but at the same time, really high asset prices, um, which would make you know, a, a challenging environment for pretty much anybody, let alone insurance companies. And, and that's where, uh, you know, where I come in. I'm the CIO of uh, TIAA, which is known to be a pension plan for teachers, but does that through an uh, insurance product, which makes us an insurance company, uh, which means that we have insurance regulations, uh, which forces us to invest mostly in, in fixed income. So low rates is a, a pretty big issue for, uh, for us and, and pretty much any, any insurance company. Uh, you know, the reinvestment turnover that we have uh, you know, to put to work every year at lower rates is uh, you know, the biggest challenge that we face. Great, thank you. Oh, oh yeah, um, I think um, currently the market um, is where you know, uh, every investor has a higher level um, of uncertainty. They, ha they, ha they have to uh, deal with a higher level of uncertainty. Uh, with concerns over uh, recessionary conditions or risks or um, uh, excessive illiquid, uh, liquidity in their um, portfolio. Or uh, people worry about whether the trade war would flare up again and its implications. Um, or, you know, what would trigger the next recession uh, or the next market downturn, be it excessive corporate debt or, um, uh, you know, some mistakes in uh, the policies of some government administration. So uh, it's a lot of um, um, uncertainties there. Um, so CIC um, is China Investment Corporation, is the financial investor that focuses on um, commercial investment returns. Um, and we set up the uh, New York rep office uh, in 2017, just right before the uh, US-China trade war started to uh, build momentum, so good timing. Um, so in the past two years, we have seen more uh, stringent uh, CFIUS reviews uh, by foreign invest uh, for uh, foreign investments. Um, and CIC, um, because its status as a sovereign wealth fund of China, um, it, it makes it inevitable for CIC to be involved in some sort of uh, uh, political geopolitical risks. Um, so uh, it makes it more difficult for CIC to, uh, to uh, do some direct investment here in the U.S. Um, and we do hope that things could improve um, later on. Great. I work for a, a Bermuda-based reinsurance company called Access Capital. Uh, we're global. Um, we, we have about 15 billion in AUM. My, our CIO and I, uh, we've all, we've been from, we've been in direct investing backgrounds our entire careers, but here at Access Capital, we're actually investing with outside managers as well. Um, and I, I personally, I manage our credit, uh, private equity, and real estate uh, portfolios. I think the, the current environment, uh, if, I was, if I were sitting here last year, you know, would have talked about inflation and interest rates and, you know, what the Fed's, tr you know, what the Fed's trying to do to get inflation where they need it to be. But I think it's more appropriate to, to, to borrow from what, what Ray Dalio said and then what Mohammed said uh, this morning, that we are really in monetary policy part three. Uh, so part two is sort of coming to an end and we're in part three, which I think is targeted to, you know, our 50 plus trillion in unfunded liabilities that somebody might have to monetize going forward, uh, as well as uh, the trade war, uh, which is going on as well. Good afternoon. I'm um, the head of private debt for the U.S. for CDPQ. CDPQ, for those of you who don't know, is the manager for the pension assets for the province of Quebec. We're about $225 billion in assets in five different asset classes, public equities, fixed income, where I sit, real estate, private equity, and um, infrastructure. Um, so the challenges for us obviously vary by asset class, but overall the theme of the institution, what we're looking to do is invest more in 
illiquid assets take a very, obviously a very long-term view. We've been doing that for a long time, both in private equity and infrastructure, obviously in the real estate as well, where we own buildings around the world. In fixed income, uh, and I've joined a couple of years ago to really develop a private debt strategy where our focus is to really, again, increase the non-investment grade private debt uh, piece of our portfolio to, we don't need liquidity, so we want to generate, obviously, a higher return with better structures and, um, you know, again, tighter uh, protections for us as, uh, than the uh, broadly syndicated market. So the challenge for us in, in both organizationally and for us in our, uh, in our strategy in, in, in private debt is really the, con the confluence of continued low interest rate, but obviously being very late in the credit cycle. So how do we adjust that in terms of deploying more capital in uh, illiquid private credit? So we have a team that's been formed of 15 people just focused on private debt where we can originate and do our own diligence, as well as work with outside managers. And we feel it over time, there is still uh, a lot of opportunity to invest in private credit. Uh, despite where we are in the cycle, we think that um, we don't see a you know 2008 and 9 uh, recession the same you know coming the same fashion. So we think that it will be it will be um, less severe, but still you know we want to focus on quality uh, structures and quality assets. But the fact also that we institutionally are thinking more about a low growth scenario and what are the implications for the various portfolios within CDPQ in terms of how we construct them. That is you know, a clear port, part of our strategy in terms of how do we adjust our investments um, and our philosophy to reflect the fact that we'll be, we could potentially be in a, in a very low, low growth and low interest rate environment for a long time. And still our goal is obviously to achieve uh, good returns for the employees of the province of Quebec to generate a good return above the benchmark that we are, we're trying to be. So that's been our challenges. Um, I'm Mark Burgess. I'm from Australia. I spent most of my career overseas, but I currently uh, sit on a, a chair of board for a large pension plan. But I previously ran the uh, Sovereign Fund in Australia. I was the president and CEO. Um, what are we dealing with today? Um, I'm reminded of my students. I, I lecture students, as you do at my age, I suppose, and also give them some uh, career advice. And they always say to me, you know, why was your career so good? And it's just very simple, which is that I joined the markets about 35 years ago when interest rates were very high, and I've been sailing the rate of change ever since. Um, and in fact, I think there are about 12 or 13 different indicators that have been very, very favorable over that period. Uh, the one that the students really struggle to believe is that I say to them, is the world violent today? And they go, yes, of course it is. And of course, today is the least violent in human history. And we know that. Um, but there are many others, and, and you know, the demographics were favorable. But one of the ones that are really critical uh, is that interest rates just continued to fall during the period. So it's not just the absolute level of rates we're at now, it's the fact that they were falling. And that's had a compounding effect for anyone who's been long duration. And, uh, and that's the challenge today. It isn't just that rates of return are low, but in the next cycle, uh, PE, long duration assets, will get found out because there is no more rate cutting on which to revalue to bail you out. And so this is why we're at such a critical point. And it's, it's partially why I think people are uh, kind of cautious about what's going on is because they can sense that the tailwinds have been phenomenal for a very long period of time and now we have to figure out what to do next. Mark, maybe just building on that, the trajectory of rates, is, is it a race to the bottom? Is there, is there hope will uh, we'll change trajectory, if you have a view? Uh, look, how much bottoming can you get when you've already got negative rates? Um, but what's going on behind all of that, of course, is, is that we have a major demographic change. Everyone knows about demographics. But what we're about to do is we're putting economies through absolute declines in population. And, and the difference between a growth rate and an absolute fall in population is very significant for asset prices. Uh, you know, the example I give people, 10 houses in the street, population growing, all houses get bid up. 10 houses in the street, population absolutely declining and the 10th person dies. All the other houses are worth scrap because the 10th, 10th one's vacant. Now it's not gonna work like that, but what actually happens is the dynamics of the system doesn't work well and this is what we're beginning to see transferred from, from, uh, from places like uh, Japan, which we know has already been through, going through the cycle, to Europe, to Germany, et cetera. Um, and so we have a sort of major demographic change that will not only change the growth rate, but will change the way financial assets behave and credit behaves behind that. Uh, and so our hope is the four or five countries with great demographics, India, Indonesia, Philippines, places like that. And I, we're just not sure that it's gonna all connect together to give us the growth rate that we, we require. 
Uh, just to answer your question directly, though, I think the one positive thing that's come out since Jackson Hole is I do believe I'm, I'm on a think tank for central banks and sovereign wealth funds, and we do about 150 meetings a year with central bankers. Even they've realised that negative rates wasn't such a good idea because of the signalling effect, mm -hmm. and I think there's a recognition that go there carefully. And so maybe rates are just going to stabilise at very low levels, but I think we've reached the bottom, basically. Sure, sure. Um, Jay, thinking of, of rates at low levels and sort of meeting return targets, you have a number of levers to pull within your remit. Just curious sort of how you're managing that and what, what steps you're taking to, yeah. to meet return targets. Yeah, sure. And, and just a point on the rates is uh, I appreciate that, Mark. And, you know, if you, th if you think about negative interest rates, is it really – is it really a monetary policy or is it really part of the trade war? I mean, it was started in Switzerland as an attempt to keep their currency from you know, tripling and you know, crushing their current account. So that the negative interest rate is also sort of a tax on capital. It's a tax on the capital account, which is analogous to a tariff. Um, and you know, we think that if Europe's political environment is such that they don't want to continue this policy or make it any worse, then that means that the U.S. is unlikely to have to go to negative interest rates. So that's one. And then the second point I'd make there is that uh, you know inflation has been kept low by technology. That's something the Fed has now said a number of times. And if you think about e-commerce penetration uh, in the United States and when it sort of took off in the mid 2000s and what that did to our inflation rate, that's just now happening in the emerging markets. So we could actually see 10 years of lower than normal inflation rates in the emerging markets because they are 10 years behind in terms of e-commerce penetration in everything they do. Uh, in terms of meeting our targets, you know, it just, it puts us, it puts everybody on this panel and it puts everybody in a higher risk position. So yes, we're, you know, we're gonna invest in private credit just like everybody else does, but we're gonna have to be careful. We're, we're going for you know, the best collateral we can find. We're going for the best structures we can get our hands on so that when the downturn comes, you know, we're going to be able to go to our board and say, we really like what we own. And even though it's marked down, we know that it's not going to have a permanent loss. That's great. Nick, you, you face a number of unique constraints with, uh, with, it, with your framework. What, what, what changes, what sort of uh, adjustments are you making? Uh, at low rates. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. It's this, the same that you just heard. I mean, I, there's no magic bullet out there, obviously. Um, you know, we don't have the magic sauce that no one else has. Uh, what we do have is an illiquid liability, which allows us to do as much of what Jay just described as, as we possibly can. Um, you know, having an illiquid liability that's backing a pension, so it's, it's perfectly fine. That's bas basically what you want to have backing a pension. Allows us to go out and pick up liquidity premiums. Mm -hmm. um, you know, across various asset classes. Um, so that's basically what we're doing to try and combat low rates at this point. And what we like about it is similar to what Jay was saying is, uh, is that it's also a defensive positioning at this point in the cycle as well, because we prefer privates over publics. The covenants, the ability to get closer to the borrower, you know, work with the borrower in, in a bad situation, um, you know, it works out to a better recovery in the end. Sure, sure. And Hong, maybe from your perspective, um, you, you have some unique constraints as well. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, colleagues here already offered a very uh, valuable uh, insights. Uh, for CIC, um, we, again, uh, we, we, what we can do is, you know, just continue to uh, diversify and uh, continue to identify companies that with a sustainable business model. Um, and we hope to um, build a defensive portfolio um, and also for the uh, it, it liquidity, um, a, a liquid premium, I think we would seek um, such premium more tied to operational improvement rather than financial engineering. Sure, sure. Robert, you, you had mentioned um, focusing on structuring and building a resilient portfolio within private debt and whatnot. Maybe just some more on that, just as it seems from the panel and uh, more broadly, just a very popular area for, sure. for cash flows now. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's, it's a theme for the whole organization. We talk about resiliency and building a portfolio that will sustain market volatility. And the best example of that was last year when CDBQ returned, I think, was 4.2%, which was materially higher than uh, the index by probably 2% because of the fact that our portfolio was very resilient and focused on quality. So despite the volatility at the end of 2018, we were able to generate a return that was nominally materially lower than 2017, uh, but materially better than, than the benchmark. So 
that's a theme for the organization. So translating that into, into what we're trying to do in, in fixed income and private debt is, again, getting the right resources and the right team to be able to do our own diligence, uh, develop our own view on, 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 on credits, whether it's, and we do have private debt in corporate credit, but we also have other teams that focus on specialty lending as well as real estate. And we, again, focus on making sure that we understand as best as we can the risk, do a real deep dive in diligence um, and be able to live with that credit um, if it goes through a cycle. So we don't, we specifically focus away from, you know, cyclical companies, or if we do look at cyclical companies, they will have to be levered in the right fashion so that they can go through a cycle. But otherwise it's picking the sectors that we feel will be resilient through a cycle, whether it's business services, technology, uh, healthcare, that we feel have long-term growth potential, even if you go through a cycle and, and have to deal with potential problems that we will have in our portfolio. So the good news is we're, we're at the beginning of that effort in terms of building that portfolio. So we're transitioning from a uh, much more liquid portfolio to more private. So we both have the resources in place in terms of people, but also the benefit of being fully invested and don't really have the pressure to deploy capital if we feel that the opportunities are not appropriate for us. So it's at least for now, because we're at the beginning, we do have the, the benefit of really choosing the right investments to be able to deploy capital in a thoughtful way. Great, great. Uh, Mark, you, you talked a bit about uh, demographics, but outside of that, perhaps, is there an economic factor or, or, or trend that you're seeing that is of note or concern? Um, yeah, look, there's, uh, there's, there's plenty, always concerns. I thought the comments previously, there's always uncertainty in the world, and so you can always find concerns. Um, but, you know, we, we're clearly in transition. And, you know, take the Chinese economy, it knows it's in transition. And uh, I did quite a, quite a lot of work up there. It's in our region. Um, they've been looking to internalize their growth rate. They've known that growth, extern the ex export model of Japan and South Korea would eventually reach limits. Um, but the concern for them is that this has happened a bit sooner than expected. And my sense when I've been up there a few times this year is that they've been worried about that. Um, on the other hand, they're doing strategic things. They're opening up the markets. I had to speak at something two weeks ago on this. They're being very clear about their allowance of foreign investors. They're being very clear about paying down debt. Um, but that's a big transitional change. They're an important grower. They've been very important to the overall growth dynamics. The question for us now, though, is if I'm concerned is, as I said before, the growth now has to be found in other places. And if I was running the IMF, I'd be concentrated on them and helping them do it well. So, for example, the banking problems in India today actually matter because it's one of the growth drivers for the next decade. And so they're the sum of the dynamics is that change. On the very positive side, the demographics here in the US are good. Uh, the country is actually well run. <laughs> I mean that in a broad sense. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, commercialism is very good here. And, and this, this, is, this is good, but it's now patchy. And it gets to an overall theme, which is because the trends have been so great for 35 years, and this is sort of obvious to state, uh, it'll now be the art of investing that'll really matter. In other words, if you're a private equity investor today, you won't be able to rely on falling rates to get revaluation in the entire portfolio. About 75 to 80% of your return will be how good you are at actually running the company. The rest of it, or take infrastructure. There isn't an infrastructure manager today who isn't good, right? But some of them are buying stuff that's now getting fringy that is not very good. So it's the art of, of being the bottoms up as well as the top down investor that will be the trick in the next five years. That's perhaps obvious to state, but finding really great managers is going to matter so much more. So speaking of really great managers and sort of finding the best, um, there's been a lot of fee consolidation across the industry and a bit of a jump ball, but has that opened new doors for any of you? Has that made anything that was previously too expensive now viable or improved the utility of a, of a financial product to, to anyone on the, on the panel? Not, not yet. <laughs> I mean, for us, we're, again, we have a team that's dedicated to do uh, all on direct investing, but we, because of our deployment targets, we have also the need for third-party managers. And historically, uh, we've looked at it as a somebody to, that would deploy capital in a segment that we can't really do ourselves. And we still think about it that way. But now we're thinking more of a managers as partners that can help us achieve our strategy of direct investing. So co-investments, which if some of you are managers, I've heard from a lot of LPs as well that this is critical. It is very important to us to be deploying capital in a very cost efficient way. So yes. Thankfully, and we love to have fee pressure on the part of external managers because it's better for our depositors. We get to be a lot more efficient in deploying capital. Um, but it's not, you know, fee for us is really 
it's important, but it's more how does that manager fit in terms of what we're trying to do strategically? How can they help us achieve what we're trying to do in a cost-efficient fashion? And you know, we used to think about managers as looking at folks that have a very big platform that can deploy a lot of capital. Now we're thinking, well, we have our own team. We want to be important to that manager. For us to deploy or to give a mandate of you know, half a billion dollars to somebody who has 100 under management, you know, it's great. They're a great platform, but we won't really see as much benefit in what we're trying to do than deploying 500 to somebody who has 4 billion under management, where we become very important to them and help them a lot in their growth. So we're, we're really thinking about it as a, as a way for us to, again, achieve what we're trying to do strategically and uh, analyze whoever comes to us for a proposal, which you know, there's a lot of, of activity on that front. People know where to find us. Um, and we've met a lot of managers, but that's kind of how we're thinking about it going forward. Sure, sure. Nick, just, you... to, just to add to yeah, that, please. I mean, we, when, we, when we invest in a private equity fund, you know, we're going to ask them, how much are you really going to deploy? Are you going to get to 100% or not? Because if they're only going to get to 70%, that's going to waste a lot of our capital and we're going to pay a higher fee structure. You know, people also talk about J-curve and a lot of people talk about it in the context of the optics of are you losing money for the first year or second year. We, we think about it in the economic context of what's the total amount of fees that we're paying. It doesn't matter when we're paying them for the amount of capital that we're going to deploy. It also helps us if the manager has an existing seed portfolio that's already on the board. That gives us visibility. We know that they're going to be able to get their job done in, in the next you know, two, three, whatever years. Um, and it also reduces that kind of quote unquote J curve. And then finally, you know, with a lot of investments that are illiquid, if we can get that in a semi open ended or a somewhat liquid structure, where we has, have some power to, you know, push the stop button and just let our portfolio run off. That helps us out a lot in terms of our own internal capital management liquidity metrics as well. That's great. Um, Nick, as you uh, look across a broad range of investments, is there anything that you're, you're not doing that's off the table? It's just uh, we're too late in the economic cycle or is too risky a region? Is there anything that just is a, is a flat out no? Outside of uh, OFAC countries, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is obvious. Um, probably, I would say currency. Currency as an asset class, whether it's traditional currency or crypto. Um, it just feels a bit to me like it's... Um, there's not a lot of expected return, but there's quite a bit of all, and that's not something that a, an investor like us that has to worry about capital charges, um, you know, put up against their assets, so, you know, would be concerned about. So, uh, that's everywhere else we probably are comfortable going, but I would sure. say currency as an asset class is a place we can look. Sure, sure. Hong, same question to you. Yes. Anything off the table? CNC is a sovereign wealth fund, so we have to play it safe, so we won't enter into um, like too risky areas, mm -hmm. uh, especially countries with. Uh, uh, great geopolitical risks. Sure, sure. Mark, as uh, out, outside of markets and with with, with your with your teaching and whatnot, is there an area that you find challenging? Is it talent retention? Is it uh, you know what, what what sort of things outside of markets are, are a challenge for your organization? Um, for the organization generally, uh, institutions. Uh, I love the last presentation about skin in the game. You know, we we have a problem there essentially because people don't own the institution. Uh, in our case, we're owned by the members, for example, or well, most, most are. Um, and so finding people who are really, really great investors, paying them well, but also creating the culture that keeps them hopping uh, is, is very important. And, and there is a problem for asset owners, which I found when I was at the Future Funds, first time I've been on the asset owner's side, um, is that when you're an asset owner, you've only got one client usually, and it's the investment committee. Um, and uh, you don't have a lot of clients out there asking you questions, keeping you sharp, right? And in fact, the people that, the, the, that our staff do meet are usually fund managers who tell them how great they are, right? And so over time, the culture of the asset owner is not as sharp as the culture that you get on the, on the buy side. And, and so for us, it's about attracting people, but it's about creating the culture. Sure. Um, the one thing I'll say is that uh, Bridgewater do take people. And when, when you send people to Bridgewater, they come back different. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean that genuinely. I had a guy once who was always bearish. And for his career development, that is a very limited field of always being bearish. And this is a true story. We sent him up there and, and, and he spent three weeks and he came back a different man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's because, the, you know, frankly, in their case, they do not care. They so strongly believe in their culture that they were going to ask him as many tough questions as they asked themselves. 
and that made him a better person. But inside asset owners, it's hard to create that hopping culture. But whereas you're, you're an asset manager, you're seeing so many clients that you better be sharp, you're gonna lose the race. And so that's there's some of the challenges that we have is not just attracting, but creating the right culture so that you're absolutely at the cutting edge at all times. Yeah. It's one of the benefits, by the way, that I think CIA has, because we're both an asset owner and an asset manager. Right. So wholly own a very large asset manager um, under the brand of Nubeen. And that creates, I think, that the appropriate mix inside of the culture that we're, that we're looking for. Jay, this is the time of year when a lot of folks make goals for the next year and whatnot, both on the uh, business side, but on the, on, 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 the, on the market side as well. Any, anything on the agenda for you guys as you uh, look forward? Yeah, sure. I mean, for, so from the, from the investment perspective, I think this is probably front and center on a lot of people's minds is preparing for a possibility of a recession. You know, how is your portfolio going to look in that scenario? And uh, you know, are you are you investing in the right things, and, and what actions may or may may you not take uh, if that happens? Uh, on the on the business side, um, you know, the insurance and reinsurance business is also uh, it's a challenging, and, and there are many who know a lot more about this topic than I do, but it, it's a challenging business. We are you know, there's a lot of technological disruption. There's a lot of competition. Uh, recently, there was a, a an M and A spree in the reinsurance industry. You had uh, larger firms from, from Asia paying even two times book to buy reinsurance companies because they, they looked at them as just kind of a bond portfolio. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we do at, at Axis is we have a team, uh, not my team, but we have a team dedicated to strategic investments uh, in fintech and insurtech. And they, they engage with outside partnerships to sort of get ahead of that and play offense instead of defense. Great, great. Anyone else, uh, any initiatives? I, I was going to add one thing. For us, it's really where it's a couple of things. One is because we're deploying more in private debt, we know that there's going to be more problems in the portfolio. So, which is something that's relatively new for a um, a team that has been mostly with more conservative, safer credits. So, how do we think about and how do we set ourselves to be able to manage those problem situations? Having the right skill set, it's something that we're we're thinking about for you know 2020 and beyond. We're also looking at uh, potentially investing outside of the North America and Europe, where we currently have our, our teams looking at emerging market. We're starting to think about how do we deal with uh, Asia or potentially investing in, in, um, in South America. It's been challenging in terms of finding managers in South America to, that we feel would be a good strate strategic fit for us. Uh, we are putting in place something in India where CDBQ has been very active in India over the last you know, five, six years, working with local partners uh, to invest in, particularly in infrastructure and more recently in private equity. So we're probably going to do something in India as well in corporate credit. There's a group of very, very good um, managers that have established track records. And, and for us, it's a way to dip our toes in uh, emerging markets in a way that will give us the ability to learn about the market and see if it, if, if it does provide a better return. Uh, for our capital. So not huge amounts of money, but certainly something that help us expand beyond North America and uh, in Europe. Great. I would actually, uh, yeah. I would agree the, the challenge around distressed investing is a pretty big one because it's very difficult to maintain a, a team that has that skill set when there aren't a lot of distressed assets. You know, you're not going to hire a bunch of people and have them sit there and do nothing. They're not going to want to sit there and do nothing um, waiting for the, the wave to occur. And it's been much longer than anyone expected for that wave to come. Um, so that, that's a huge challenge, I think, for pretty much every asset owner. Sure. The interesting part is whether you want to invest in distress. We're not doing that in, right. in fixed income within our group. Some of the pockets of CDPQ is doing that. But, but you're right. It's been relatively spotty in terms of return in the last five years just because of the environment that mm -hmm. we've been in. Um, but for us, the focus is really not necessarily to look at investing in distress assets, but just managing the problems that we're going to have. Yeah. And how do we deal with that in the most cost-efficient fashion? Whether we do it all in-house or do we use outside resources, we're still, you know, trying to figure that out. Sure, sure, fair enough. Um, well, with, with the idea of leaving time for uh, questions here, we're going to do uh, a little bit of a lightning round. Um, so these are four questions, and we'll let each of you answer them, and then we'll go to the next question. Um, so, will the S and P five hundred be higher or lower in twelve months? Just up or down? <laughs> Are we going to come back in 12 yeah, months? Yeah, to, yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Am I going to be, yeah. be held to this in any way? It's documented somewhere. Yeah. Uh, lower. Okay. Well, 
<laughs> well, I, I really want to ask my colleague. But I think it would be higher. <laughs> I hope it would be higher. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say lower. I think it'd be lower. I'd say it'd be higher, to be honest with you. I'll say higher. All right. Did you, did you go to Bridgewater? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that'll beat me up and I'll go lower. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, 10-year yields, higher or lower in 12 months? You know, on the hope side, higher, but <laughs> I, I, I get the feeling lower. No. I think flat or target around 2%. I think it might be lower, but not that much. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd buy the flat story. Right. Fair enough. Will Brexit be resolved in the next six months? <laughs> yes or no? Uh, yes. <laughs> Fingers crossed. No. <laughs> no, I think immigration is a big issue. I think so. Yeah. I hope so for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they'll resolve it. The most important thing is they do it on the right day of the year because they're <laughs> the only country in the world that doesn't have a national day. Right? And they desperately need a sense of identity, so they should choose the summer. I pick July, nice day to have a public holiday on which to celebrate. Right? Uh, what does resolve mean, by the way? That's, the, that, that's yeah. for you guys to decide, yeah. That's, that's, that's the... <laughs> um, last one before we do questions with the audience. Uh, will we still be talking about crypto in three years? Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. I think so. Absolutely. Great, great. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll open... Uh, to questions from the audience. I don't know if we have a mic or we're just raising hands. We do have a mic. Um, we have one in the, in the back there. Thank, thanks, Travis. Uh, uh, Rob Culler in here. Um, on, the, on the emerging markets or sort of the, uh, the international expansion a couple of you all mentioned that, but then some difficulties. Um, is that related to potentially the um, the scale of you know you all are wanting to put out more capital, or is it um, uh, sort of the dynamic between family-owned businesses less uh, less open to uh, um, to um, equity give up or rule of law type things? Can you expand a little bit upon that? I think this was driven a little bit from our folks from Canada and um, a couple of other. Yeah, I, I can take that. I, mean, I think it's. It's all of what you've said in the sense that when we're thinking about where it makes sense, you need to think about the lo obviously the, um, you know, the legal regime in that country, uh, the history of investing in your, in your asset class, um, you know, track record, the type of teams, and is there a cultural fit in the way that people invest in your asset class versus what you, you're doing yourself? Um, and then what are the returns? And in, in our case, being uh, Canadian, when we make an investment in private debt, we don't really think about currency um, because we hedge it at a higher level and we just, whether it's euros, whether it's Canadian dollars, US dollars, sterling, whatever currency we can hedge, we think about it and it's not a factor in our return decision. But when you're looking at emerging market, it obviously becomes a bigger issue. And thinking about those market is, does it really make sense to deploy capital if at the end of the day, with the tax implication, with the currency implication, you're gonna end up with a return that's marginally better than what you can do domestically. Does it really make sense? So these are all factors that we think about as we look at deploying in emerging markets. And in, in fixed income, in corporate credit for us, it's something that's relatively new, but that's how we've been thinking about it. And so far, we've thought of India as the first step for us to kind of dip our toes into that market. I think, I think that if you look at standard standard markets and emerging markets, they've, you know, they've rallied and there's not that much of a risk premium there versus, uh, versus developed markets. You know, we are looking at specific opportunities in emerging markets as well. So for example, India just passed the, the bankruptcy law that helps uh, real estate debt, that sector working out real estate loans that makes it safer. Um, Australia, uh, as Mark, Mark knows, has a situation where you have a, a banking oligopoly and so the, the yields that you can earn in private credit in Australia with really good collateral are actually quite high. Uh, in Brazil, we've looked at the system of federal claims there and you know, there are managers that try to accumulate those at a discount. Uh, and you know, Argentina, hard to invest in, but um, as uh, many in the room uh, may know that they have a public private partnership uh, opportunity there where they're they're building power plants and they're you know it's all sort of US dollar denominated so we are looking at specific situations I think standard markets have, have lifted 
Yeah, I must say we're at a critical moment though because um, they need to. We need to have the game, the rules of the game, still set the way we've been used to it. And I'm not suggesting it necessarily will change, but I'm very impressed by how brave the Canadians are in terms of allocating to some of these markets. But you would not want to get in there and get your capital stuck. That is distinctly possible if we get bad behaviours by everybody where we don't believe in the system. And, and this thing gets to infrastructure. For their, for their sake, it'll be great if we can convince the countries to have really sound and stable regulatory environments. But with the volatility that's going on, uh, we need US leadership and we need leadership from everyone else who's, who set the system to continue to set it. If they don't, then we've got to think about exactly what sort of risk we're, we're taking. It's an outside story, but it's the first time in the last 35 years that I'm now particularly thinking that through personally. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good point. Uh, the world is moving against globalization. There's no question about that. Um, so there's a lot of potential peril. And you know, we're, so TIA is huge. I mean, we're, we have the scale. Uh, we have a, a, a very large investment organization. We're pretty much across the globe. We're investing in commercial mortgages in Australia. We're investing in real assets in emerging markets. Um, but those are genuine concerns now because you're right, the world has shifted, I think, into a different regime. It's and shifted. We have a slightly quirky thing. I talked about the positive demographic countries. Uh, the thing is that the ones that are the most positive also have a youth bulge currently. And youth bulges are very dangerous periods. Uh, amazingly, in Japan in the late 50s, there were student riots because they couldn't employ them quickly enough. Mm -hmm. US late 60s. Whenever you get this youth bulge coming through on a 10, 15 year view, it's fantastic. But in a short term view, and this is partially why we're getting riots and other things, partially. Um, and some of these big countries have got to get through some of that stuff too. That said, if you're a long-term investor like we are, and you believe in the system, and we continue to work on the system, that's where you're going to get future growth. Yeah, combining the the youth bulge with, with the wealth gap, correct, mm -hmm. it can be a pretty dangerous yeah. combination. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we recently had a change in the leadership of uh, European Central Bank. And uh, together, that fact and the noise that comes out of the insurance industry as well as banking, especially in Europe, uh, there's an obvious desire and pressure and wish, I guess, to change the regime. But what do you think in your mind is the chance for something like that happening and the knock-on effect to our markets? Who wants to take that? Yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about the change in regime at the central bank in, in Europe? Yeah. So I sit on this think tank called OMFIF, and we, as I said, had 150 meet meetings a year with central bankers around the world. And uh, yeah, Europe's in a critical moment. Um, the central bankers themselves need to rethink this. So I asked them recently, the thing I was added, how much work have you done on demographics? Um, so for example, we're used to saying that Japan's not growing, but GDP per capita has been one of the best in the world, right? And so maybe they've got to rethink some of their processes and systems, but you're, but you're absolutely correct is that Europe's got some moments of truth, a lot of pressure on, uh, the guard thinking that she'll bring in fiscal. I'm not so sure she will. Um, so yeah, it's one to watch. And but I think it gets to a generalized theme, which is central banks have run out of bullets. I think Jackson Hole was very significant this year. They're essentially, essentially saying that. And we as investors just have to get used to that scenario. Yeah. But I, I would argue that um, part of the problem has been that monetary policy and fiscal policy just haven't been aligned. Right. Right. So, you know, when, when you had monetary policy easing in, in Europe, you also had fiscal austerity, right? So if you can get, you know, actually it's true for the U.S. as well, get your act together and, and find a way to actually, you know, put those two policies together in force. Infrastructure, for example, is just seems like, you know, the right thing to do right now across the globe that could, you know, increase growth, increase in, you know, employment even further than it is already. Um, but it just doesn't feel like the, the impetus is there. Uh, you know, a, a regime change or a, sh a change in leadership is the appropriate time to start thinking about these kinds of things. I think it's a good point. Jackson Hole is particularly significant because they're prepared to talk about fiscal, central bankers are, and they know that fiscal is political. That is a big psychological change yeah. for them because they're basically saying we've run out of ammunition. It's your very point. Uh, they do not want to look too political because they'll lose their independence. And this is the trade-off that's going on between central bankers and everybody else at the moment. Right, because you don't want to go even lower in rates, right? We talked that, about that before. We want to yeah. keep rates close to zero and use something else to try and stimulate the economy. I think, I think it's also appropriate to think about what would European monetary policy be uh, with uh, Italy and potentially Greece not being part of the euro as opposed to being part of the euro. That, you know, including them, you know, introduces this sort of deflationary force because you're putting an artificially strong currency on countries that have lower pro labor productivity. 
So, and, and I, I actually, I personally think it's still in the next five years, one of the risk factors that you do see a country leaving the Euro. Mark, through your think tank, what sort of reliance do central bankers place on the need for fiscal policy? Meaning like to say, when we say they're out of bullets, is it on to you fiscal policy or do they, are they re fully relying on that for the next uh, leg of stimulus or? Uh, they've started to hint at it and remembering that they've not got involved in that for a very long period of time. Um, and, and I think the other thing is to be a little critical of central banks. I'm reminded of, I lived in New York in the 87 crash and after the 87 crash, remember the bank credit analysts, the joke was that they said have 65% cash and whatever it is, 35% canned food, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that was because they were thinking about the depression. They, mm -hmm. they were looking at the two and, and the thing that we learned from the 87 crash was that monetary policy can, can st st stick a floor under things. And that's now 30 years of doing the same thing. And even the central bankers, they don't want to stand up and say, because it's a huge blow to your ego as a central banker to say, I've run out of bullets, I've, I've lost my power. But I think even they are starting to, to, to indicate that. But they're trying to grow, must, uh, figure out a way to do that without becoming political. MMT, let's face it, if MMT came in, they're essentially becoming a fiscal arm of government. They should probably just give up independence and see what happens. I mean, we might finally get inflation back. Um, but they're the sort of dynamics that at the margin, central bankers, I think, are changing their, their thinking. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question um, or we'll close it there, perhaps. There's a question right there. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So uh, basically, I guess one of the, the uh, topics that came up was the, the demographic changes in emerging markets and the youth dividend in certain countries, uh, you know, make them uh, give them certain attractive investment qualities. Um, do you think there's an emerging sort of given this deglobalization uh, an emerging metric uh, where sort of these, these countries that are benefiting from the move away um, you know, from certain parts of Asia of the supply chain to other countries? Uh, and sort of what would the, the metrics you would, uh, you would look for for that change to, to, to observe any of the changes? Anybody? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, we, so we, within emerging markets, what would, what signals would you look for for the change in regime or the change in sort of comfort and stability of investing? Is that? Oh, I yeah. There's been some academic work, which I tweeted out to all of my 500 followers. So, I can, so if, you, if you look me up, you'll be 501 or whatever it is. Uh, probably most of them are robots, right? But uh, uh, I just can't remember the lady's name, but she's done very interesting work and just recently, and she's put out some stuff looking at how China's behaving here. And so they're attaching their supply chain to Europe and others. There's no question, I go to a CFO event each June where we all sit around with CFOs. CFOs are great because they're informed but they're not egotistical like CEOs. So they tend to tell you what they think and you can have a conversation. And there's no question the last two meetings, we do this in Europe, there's lots of major global CFOs. But they, they've just stopped investing because they don't know where the supply chain's gonna go. And I think they're sitting out, frankly, the Trump administration to see how this plays out in the next 12 months. But, but the answer to the supply chain is not that simple. It was interesting, Mohamed Alarian mentioning bimodal distributions. The one he didn't mention today in the chart I use a lot, the ILO did one on the bimodal distribution of labor, right? And this has been in case, it's in the 1980s, we injected a, a one and a half billion fresh workers at cheap prices. And the two curves are trying to come together, but they're still a long distance apart. And so that's the friction of the globalization is that they if the, as I say to people, if we all started in the 1800s, we'd have one global distribution of labor, but instead we're in disequilibrium. And so that friction is bumping. And I think what you're trying to allude to there is to the countries on the left-hand side, those with cheap labor trade with each other because everyone else blocks them off or some other mechanism. And there's no doubt global firms are trying to figure this out. And so the big, unfortunately for Britain, the easiest decision they can make is just not put anything in the UK because they don't win, doesn't matter what happens, <laughs> right? <laughs> But, but they're trying to figure out these distribution channels. And when you talk to them informally, uh, even, you know, should I put in Mexico? Is that actually already set or isn't it? And so they just hesitate a bit. And so you get 10 or 15% corrections in investment. And so I think it'll get resolved. I think it will be more regionalized, but it's still working its way through the system. And she's done some very good work if you just look up my tweet. <laughs> what might, it's might worth. be a, a good way to get inflation up, anti-globalization, I guess. Not the best way, but that might be one way to get it. it it's, people ask about inflation and, and and my, I'm reminded of this, so 15 years ago, I interviewed a strategist and she was very young. And I said, what do you make of inflation? She looked me in the eye and she said, a statistical anomaly, right? Because <laughs> she'd never seen it, she'd only studied it. And she really helped me. She made me rethink my own thoughts because I'd only ever seen inflation. Um, but now at the margin, if you ask anybody, everyone believes in lower for longer. Mm -hmm. That's an absolute consensus now from what I can observe. 
and no one really believes inflation is coming back. But if you think about what's helped inflation, free trade's helped it. Mm -hmm. Global warming won't help inflation with rising food prices. There's a bunch of these dynamics that at the margin could arguably be, on a five or eight year view, the emergence of a style of inflation that perhaps we haven't seen before. When we, when we think supply chain, we think labor costs are higher in China, so you're gonna get more manufacturing in Vietnam. On the other hand, China's benefiting from more pharmaceutical development coming into China. That was traditionally only India. Uh, but one of the trends we see is e-commerce across the world and e-commerce increases the demand uh, by an intensity factor of 3x, increases the demand for simple industrial warehouses. Uh, so that's something that's been in the newspapers a lot in the US. I think uh, Blackstone's been in the news as buying billions and billions of dollars of uh, warehouses in the US. Uh, when we look at Europe, uh, France, uh, Germany, uh, continental Europe, especially Spain, their e-commerce penetration is, is uh, anywhere from a few years to even 10 years behind uh, the US. And so we, we like the idea of buying industrial warehouses in continental Europe. Uh, that trend is also happening in the emerging markets. I just want to add that um, it won't be that uh, easy to move supply chain out of China. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing they have to think about is the educated labor. And just think, it, think about it, you can assign a U.S. manager to China because it has a better working environment. But if you want to assign someone to Vietnam, then probably they would think twice. Great. Well, I think we're out of time, but thank you to, to each of our panelists. And uh, thank, thank you. you. The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work, meaningful relationships. Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni trench debt to middle market companies. Ropes and Gray, bright past, brilliant future. Aurora Capital, inspiring partnerships. And Gramercy Funds Management. We are emerging markets. Special considerations to Bank of America. Life's better when we are connected. NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Gotai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.